Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Strand. My name is Sabir. For a little bit of history, Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until after over 93 years, Strand is the sole survivor, still housing new and used books, running near 400 events a year, and putting on great events like this. So tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome Leila Assad to the Rare Book Room to discuss her brand new book, Me and White Supremacy. Layla is a globally sought speaker on the topics of race, identity, leadership, personal transformation, and social change, as well as the host of the Good Ancestor podcast, which exemplifies her life work to leave a legacy of healing and liberation for those who will come after she is gone. Described by Elizabeth Gilbert as one of the most important and valuable teachers we have right now on the subject of white supremacy and racial injustice, it's an honor to have her here tonight. Joining her to discuss her work is Melissa Carter. Melissa is New York University's Director for Global Spiritual Life and Head of Mindfulness Education and Programming for Mindful NYU, the largest campus-wide mindfulness initiative in the country. Currently, she's an adjunct professor for the Silver School of Social Work, and she's been featured in Good Housekeeping Magazine and Billboard's Top 30 Under 30 Executives. Melissa's work and passion focuses at the intersection of spirituality, social justice, and mindfulness mindfulness. She's a meditation teacher and forever fan of Leila Saad. So without further ado, I'm thrilled to welcome these two brilliant women to the Strand tonight. So please join me in giving them a round of applause. Hello. Can you hear me okay? I see, am I on? Are we on? I see a lot of familiar faces. <laughs> it's good to be home. Aww. <laughs> Sorry about that. We had it all figured out with the chairs, and then I just totally blew it. <laughs> I was like, okay, anyway, you don't need to know all that. Okay. All right. So before we begin, we want to invite in community tonight. We don't want to just dive into you watching an interview. Tonight is about joy and celebration because it is publishing day. Yes. We made it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm going to ask each of you to turn to the person sitting to either your right or left and introduce yourself. Thank them for being here. Thank them for their humanity. Thank you them for their care because we might need each other tonight. OK, let's take a moment to do that. Okay, thank you. Everyone bring it back. Everyone bring it back. I know it's so nice meeting people, but let's bring it back now. Bring it on back. Okay, thank you. So before we dive in too, I also want to say that I want to speak directly to the BIPOC in the room. Can you define that for us? Sure. Black, indigenous people, and people of color. Experiencing what it means to live in a world that is based on white supremacy and sitting here tonight listening about this book it may cause some triggers. It will be uncomfortable and it may bring up some hard, tough emotions. And I want to recognize that um, when I read the book, and I've now read it numerous, numerous times, there was moments I was like, yes! And there's moments I cried, and there's moments I had to walk away. So tonight, when you hear things that you're actually also living, I ask that you take care of yourself. You turn to someone else who might need you. And I ask for the people of privilege in the room to respect that. OK? Agreed? Yes. OK, great. So let's begin. All right. All right. I know it's <laughs> It's not our first rodeo. This is not. <laughs> not we love talking and to each other. And we have any people here who are at NYU? Yay. Yes. Hello. Okay. Thanks for coming again. Some of the questions are the same. <laughs> OK. So how did we get here? In 2017, you were witnessing from Qatar the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. 
something happened in the moment for you. You describe that moment on Shannon Lego's Soul Food podcast through a Zora Neale Hurston quote from Their Eyes Are Watching God. That quote, she stood there until something fell off the shelf inside her. Then she went inside there to see what it was. It was her image of Jody tumbled down and shattered, but looking at it, she saw that it was never was the flesh and blood figure of her dreams, just something she had grabbed up to drape her dreams over. What fell off the shelf for you? I just want to say, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, but that I couldn't have imagined in 2016 that I would be sitting here having this conversation with this book, talking about this kind of work, because this wasn't what I was doing at all. My work was about business coaching and life coaching through a spiritual perspective. I had a business and a brand and a podcast called Wild Mystic Woman. Some of you may remember it. And I just wasn't talking about these subjects. And I wasn't thinking about race or blackness or anything like that. I was so deeply immersed in the world of white women's spirituality and white feminism. And I had no idea. My eyes were completely closed. And then, as many of us know, as we drew closer to the end of President Barack Obama's presidency, and we drew closer to the 2016 elections, conversations began to change globally, globally. And so my clients, who are mainly white women, were having these conversations for the first time about politics. And I was observing and watching and sort of having my own, you know, having my own internal dialogue about things that I was noticing, things that I was questioning in, my, in myself. But when the Unite the Right rally happened in Charlottesville, Virginia, and I remember seeing the images of the men marching in the streets and the anger that was in their eyes. And there was pr this one particular young white man who, you know, he, he, the state of anger that he was in, he was sweating. And he was screaming a racial slur, I guess, but it was the look in his eyes. There was an energy that came out and it was pure vitriolic hate. And what fell off the shelf inside of me was that hate is directed at me, at you, at people who look like us. And it was like a slap across the face for me. Because for many of us, in our generation, in our lifetime, it was the first time that we saw Nazis walking in the streets, proudly, feeling emboldened. You know, I remember studying Nazi history in, in, in history class, and it was like, well, that happened in the past, but now, you know, they're just fringe groups. But now here they were, protest, protesting in the street. And so what fell off in, inside the, the shelf inside of me was, this is real, this is now, this is about you and people who look like you. And that was a real reckoning for me. What I find so poetic is that was in 2017, and today you put something back on the shelf. Can we celebrate that? I love her! <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I wanted to point that out because that shows you when something's stirring inside of you to listen to it. In three years, she put something back on the shelf that's not just about... Uh, one person, it's a legacy, right? It's going to affect change from generations to come. That's massive, massive. So I was one to celebrate I'm just you. having a moment right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So also, because tonight's about joy and celebration, feel free to take a ton of pictures, post them up on Instagram, tag Layla and I, Layla F. Saad, Ignite with Melissa, and hashtag me in white supremacy, okay? Let's share the celebration with the world, share please. It. Share yeah. it, share it, share it. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's dive into the book a bit. Okay. So the design of it. Who is meant to read it and do the work? And who is it written for? Those are two different questions. I have lots of two-part questions. Yes. yes. Who is meant to do, who is meant to do the work? everybody who has white privilege. Will everybody who has white privilege do the work? No. And I knew that when I wrote the book. And so my secret plan was to write the book to the people who I know in their body, in their heart, do not want to show up and be harmful to people of color. 
It's the people who, even though they make mistakes, even though they are unconsciously aware of their racist thoughts and beliefs, their intention actually is to show up in allyship. Their intention is to do good, be on the right side of history, but they just don't know how. My secret plan is to get them on board and have them have those conversations with the people who need to do the work but aren't willing yet to listen to a, a black Muslim woman telling them to do the work. Thank you. So the Instagram challenge, which kicked this all off and then went into the digital workbook and now we stand here with an actual physical book. For people who did the Instagram challenge and then the digital workbook might be like, yeah, but I don't need the book, I already did that. Yeah. What's the difference? Can I first, just a like, show of hands, who did the Instagram challenge? Okay, who did the workbook? Okay, okay. who's bought a book today? Okay! <laughs> <laughs> it's been a journey from an idea that, well, a, a question really, that I had one night, 2 a.m., what have they learned about themselves and white supremacy ever since I started talking about white supremacy? What are the people in my community, what have they learned? And I received this download for this challenge in one night, and then over the course of 28 days, walked it out and walked. I think we have two people who raised their hand who did the challenge, right? Walked a, a group of people um, through it. In transforming it from the, the challenge to the workbook, the PDF workbook, I knew that, I knew two things. I would never, ever, ever again run a free Instagram challenge <laughs> teaching white people how to explore their complicity in white supremacy. That was, woof. Big lesson, big lesson. <laughs> big, big lesson. So we're never doing that again, but I'm also really, really glad I did it because if I hadn't, we wouldn't be up here right now. But I knew that this experience that we had had together, this transformative experience we'd had together, wasn't just intended to be a one-time thing. I knew that there were many people who watched us do the challenge and were too afraid to join us. And I knew that there were people who hadn't even known about it because they hadn't known about me, they hadn't heard about it, who needed this work too. And so I expanded it into the workbook. I was now no longer confined to an Instagram caption. I could dive a bit deeper. And I also knew from watching people go through the challenge what they needed to know what to expect. Because I went into it just following, just following, you know, as my mentor, Dr. Frantonia Pollin says, moving at the speed of inspiration, mm. not thinking about how much emotional labor is this going to be for me? And not thinking about what kind of worms have I just opened? It was very much go. This is what you're meant to do. Just follow, move at the speed of inspiration. But I could see from the feedback I was getting from people, it was hard work. Hard work, challenging work, truth work. And I wanted to be able to prepare people for what's to come. And I also had a lot of people, a, a lot of questions from people around, what if I want to do this in a group? I had this transformative experience doing it on Instagram. I want to share it with my friends, with my family members, with my, you know, my, my peers, my colleagues. How can we do this in a, in a group? And so we in included instruction on that. So we had the workbook, and again, I thought that was the end of the story. But it spread like wildfire. And when... It was, it was 100,000 downloads in six months. In about months. six months, yeah. 11,000 downloads in three days. You know, it, it, I kept moving at the speed of inspiration, not knowing what was about to happen next. Mm. And that's why I get chills just thinking about us sitting up here, because we don't know what could happen next with this. And that's exciting. It's really exciting. The, the, the thought that I had was, OK, put it in the workbook for them now. I can move on. <laughs> you know? But then companies were coming, and people were coming, and more and more people were coming, and I realized this needs to be everywhere. Yes. And, and not everyone spends their time on Instagram and on the internet. You know, people going to bookshops. People were starting to ask, how can we use this in, in ways that I hadn't anticipated? And obviously as well, people wanted an audiobook version as well. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done from the transition to the workbook, from the workbook to the book we have today, it's also a very big jump. We took a book that was, you know, the PDF workbook was 25,000 words, gutted it of about 15,000 words, and then expanded it to 50,000 words. Yes. 
And in that expansion, I added historical context. I added personal stories, which I hadn't done at all in the Instagram challenge or the PDF workbook. I added things from the media. We added quotes, um, a glossary, just more to be able to really help people do the work. And you also include a, a very strong, elaborate what's next, what to do after you put the book down. Yes. And we'll talk about that shortly. Yes, because you know, anti-racism isn't a 28-day journey. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Wouldn't it be great? <laughs> so you already spoke to one of them, but in the beginning of the book, you speak on that you need only three things to do this work. And one of them you spoke on just now being truth. Yeah. What are the other, your truth? What are the other two things? So the acronym to remember, and I wish I had known this when I wrote it. I just, uh, somebody said it back to me the other day. What you need is TLC. Oh, yes. Yes. That is it. I wish I, I, I wish had I realized that. that. Yeah. TLC, ten, not tender love and care. <laughs> T stands for truth. Yeah. You need your truth in order to do this work. This work is not about, okay. Let me lay this out. The people who are drawn to this work are the well-meaning, well-intentioned white people who want to show up as allies. But sometimes they buy this book as a way to prove that they are allies. And so they come into, ah, yes. <laughs> Recognize yourself much? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, and so they come into this work thinking, I'm buying this book because it's the right thing to do, and that's what an ally does. But in the back of their mind is, I'm one of the good ones, and that's why I'm buying this book and they don't realize how much they're about to be challenged. And as soon as they realize how much they're about to be challenged, they freak out <laughs> because they didn't realize they would have to reveal that much of themselves to themselves. Truth is really important because without truth, we're just playing at allyship and we're just wasting time. This isn't about how good of an ally you look to the world. It's not about creating a mask, a performance of allyship. It's are you really doing what this book is asking you to do, which is to dive deep within yourself to, uh, to uncover the unconscious racist beliefs that you hold that you have been conditioned into. You didn't choose them, but we all are living in a society that tells people that look like Melissa and I one thing about ourselves and people that look white, they teach you, it, you're taught a, an entirely different thing about yourself. And so you need to be able to tell the truth. So L is, uh, I'll rush through, I know. Uh, T, T is for truth, L is for love. And the reason you need love is because pain and shame are not great motivators for sustainable, lifelong work. And that's what anti-racism is. So you have to have something that's bigger than pain and shame, something that isn't like you're being kicked in the back to do the work, but that is pulling you forward into the possibility of a new world. And the last thing is commitment, because when the truth isn't enough and the love isn't enough, you have to have something even bigger than that, and that's where your commitment has to kick in to keep going. Thank you. So I want to jump right to day nine through 11, and then we'll go back. And here's one of my famous two-part questions, because I always ask two-part questions. <laughs> In the book, you talk about how, as the Instagram challenge unfolded, it wasn't until this section, anti-blackness and you, that you broke down and cried writing it, sharing it, and facilitating it. Why the three days separate of BIPOC, and what was happening within you that brought out this moment, as you describe, it sucked all the air out of the room? I had been leading the challenge from day one to eight, it was hard, it was tough, but I was okay. And then we got to day nine, and it was about you and black women. And what came out of you and black women was the real ugliness, was the real truth about how white people, especially white women, feel about black women. And what broke in me was and I'll, I will say the black women who were sort of observing the challenge and assisting me with holding the space, it was really tough for all of us. But what particularly broke in me was the little girl, the little black girl inside of me that would cry and wonder why do they hate me so much? 
she came out. And I had nothing for her because I didn't, I, I don't know. You know, it was like trying to comfort my own daughter. My daughter's 10 years old and it was like trying to comfort her. Why do they hate us so much? Why do they feel this way about us? I don't know. Let's take a breath. Mm. I need it too. Let's all take a breath. So this is the, re the reality of what it means to do anti-racism work while living black yeah. or living BIPOC. Is these are the deep questions that you've grown up with and been with your whole life of, I'm being hated for something I didn't choose, right? And I will say, you know, actually when we first started day nine, a lot of white women were like, I don't feel that way about black women. I, I love black women. I'm jealous of them even. I think they're amazing. I wish I was just like them. I want them to be my friend. I wish I could be part of their sisterhood. And they were compelled by myself and the other black women to cut the BS and tell the truth. And what came out as the truth was, when a black woman is in a position of leadership, I'm surprised. I wonder how she got there. Mm. I don't know how to act around, white, uh, around black women. I'm either afraid of them, I think they're, they're angry and aggressive, or I'm trying, everything, I'm trying to do everything to make them like me. And I don't do that with other white women. That's what broke in me was they don't know how to be human around us because they don't see us as human. Right. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Big breath. Big breath, <laughs> big breath. Another two-part question. Okay, we're gonna jump to day 22. So here in the States, we just had the Women's March, which was met with a lot of controversy and disappointment due to the lack of racial justice representation. You speak on the historical narrative of white feminism. White feminism focuses on the struggles of white women, usually all cisgendered, over BIPOC. It's feminism that is only concerned with the disparities and oppression of gender and doesn't take into account the disparities and oppressions of other intersections that are just as important, such as race, class, age, ability, sexual orientation, racial identity, and so on. White feminism will often ask BIPOC to put gender first before race. Why is that ask impossible and also holding up white supremacy? And, and part two. <laughs> <laughs> Why do feminists need to look at anti-blackness within and outside of the binary of, of gender, of male and female? Yeah. Okay, so part one was... I can repeat anything. Please, part okay. one. What was it? <laughs> Just very... Part one. Why, okay, why, is, why, is, it why is the ask impossible? Yes, why is the ask impossible? So, so I wrote a, a, viral let, a letter that went viral called I Need to Talk to Spiritual White Women About White Supremacy. And imagine throwing a, a lit match into a haystack. <laughs> that's basically what I did. Yeah, that's basically what I did. And the reason why I use that metaphor is because what you don't do is threaten white womanhood. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what you don't do is, is threaten uh, the sanctity, the purity, the niceness of white women. And that's what I did, and that's why I was often called aggressive and a bully and a racist, um, which is interesting. Why can't you be racist? <laughs> <laughs> we talk question. about that in yeah, the book, why talk. black people cannot be racist. We can be prejudiced, but we can't be racist because we don't have the power to be able to be racist. That's right. So that's a side note. Um, but... A criticism that I often got from white women was, when you talk about race, and basically when you call us out for being racist, you are dividing the sisterhood. Those are their words, not mine. My words are what sisterhood? Because you may feel in a, a sisterhood apparently towards me, but how can I feel in sistership towards you and do you want me to chop parts of myself off? You don't want to see my entire self, you only want to see the part of me that lines up with you, which is that we're both women. So when you ask why is the ask impossible, the ask is impossible because I'm not, black, I'm not a woman and then black, I'm black and woman simultaneously. That's right. And so the feminist movement 
if it really is for the equality of all genders means that every gender of every race has to find freedom in the movement. And if it's asking us just to focus on gender, for that whole thing of let's only focus on gender, it, it, what, it, what it's basically saying is that white women are raceless. That their race, their whiteness, has no impact on anything. They are just women, right? They're, you know that saying, that we're just people. It's often if you're, if you're another uh, marginalized identity, black or woman of color, that's when you're defined. But when you're a woman, you're by definition white. And so that's why it frustrates me, that's why it's impossible, that's why it perpetuates white supremacy because what it says is white people's needs come first, everyone else comes after that. And then part two is <laughs> part two. Um, the gender binary. Yeah, looking yeah. at anti-blackness and looking outside the gender binary. Why is that also important? Yes. So in the book and in the process, we go through three days of looking at black people. Uh, black women, black men, black children, which is tough. But before we even get to that, I encourage people to also look outside of the gender binary and to also look outside of heterosexual identities as well. And the reason why that's so important is because people who are not cisgendered, who are not heterosexual, not only have to face anti-blackness and racism, but they're also struggling under other forms of oppression because of those identities. And that's really important, too, because they are often the ones who are the most forgotten and the most harmed. Yeah. Thank you. So the first week of the book, let's jump back to the first week. And we're going to have to kind of run through these questions yeah. a bit quickly. Sorry. Sorry. I give really long-winded answers. Sorry. Well, no. And also, we had an hour. And I'm like, this book is amazing. How can I fit that all in? OK. So the first week of the book, you dive into behaviors white people must become aware of that they innately possess to contribute to the dismantling of white supremacy, white silence and apathy being uh, two of those behaviors. Can you talk to the introverts in the room? Yeah. To someone who may consider themselves an introvert and are trying to figure out their piece in this, but speaking up is just not something in their nature. You don't have to have a platform to practice anti-racism. Anti-racism isn't about being the loudest voice in the room or having the most number of people see you doing anti-racism. Anti-racism is a way of life. It's a practice of being and doing. that has nothing to do with whether you're using your voice. You can show up in anti-racism by speaking and having conversations one-to-one. -one. You can be practicing anti-racism by showing up at protest marches. You can be practicing anti-racism by challenging things in your community. Being an introvert, and let's define what being an introvert means, because I'm the number one introvert in here. Uh, I know it doesn't seem so, but I, I, like, I rate like 80% on the introversion scale. I'm highly introverted, and I'm on a three-week <laughs> tour, <laughs> seeing people in different cities, which is very interesting. But being an introvert means you are depleted by being around people, and you are energized by being by yourself. That's all it means. So it's all about just managing your energy. That's not an out for doing anti-racism work. It's just not an excuse. So when people use that, I'm like, OK, so does that mean that people of color get to opt out of racism because they're introverted? That's how ridiculous that sounds. You answered it. <laughs> Thank you. I was recently talking with a white woman about race. And as she went on to talk about her anti-racism work, how comfortable she feels talking about race, how she's so comfortable talking to BIPOC and asking questions, and she has no problem about bringing race into the room, and race and race and race and race and race. Uh, I clocked it. She went on for 14 minutes. At the end of the 14 minutes, she finally turned to me and said, what do you think? <laughs> About what? <laughs> I said, I really wish white people would talk less 
and listen more. Yes. And then go and have this conversation with other white people yes. and not just me. Because we have no time. <laughs> White saverism, white superiority, white apathy, white silence, optical allyship are equally harmful in how they show up. You talk in the book how each layer in some way upholds white supremacy. This question is actually not for the white people in the room, okay. but for the BIPOC. Yeah. What would you tell BIPOC sitting in this audience to hold in their hearts when encountering these various forms of white supremacy again and again and again. So what's, what's really interesting is backstage, yes. Melissa was telling me about the story and I'm like, oh my God, I just had a similar experience. I just had a similar experience and I had to figure out how to not, you know, say, can you stop talking? You know, or figure out how to like, you know, politely, you know, establish a boundary because this woman, very well-meaning, again, wanted to share everything with me, um, but was essentially just offloading her entire life story to me. And I just thought, read the room. You know, this is not about you. And so my message to black indigenous people of color is boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. It's not your job to hold space for white people to process what is coming up for them, what they are feeling, what they are experiencing in their anti-racism work. It's not your job. It doesn't matter if they're your best friend, partner, teacher, student. It doesn't matter. It's not your job to do that and you are allowed to say because this is a conversation that requires me to expend emotional labor I'm gonna need us to either switch or I'm gonna need us to you know to separate right now and that's very very hard to do <laughs> it's very very hard to do because the expectation is that we are there to 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 do that work and I think for many well-meaning white people, they feel like that is a way of showing that they're in the work, right? So I get it. Yeah, I, I get it. I do. You're, you're trying to show I'm really in the work, and I really appreciate the work, and this is what it means to me. But in the book, I talk about white centering. And essentially what happened in this conversation with Melissa and the conversation I had the other day was that it wasn't about me. It was about her what her experience has been like, what she feels, what it means to her. And so her anti-racism work has become about, it's, it's, it's like a, a self-improvement project, a personal development journey that has nothing to do with the dignity and humanity of people of color, but everything to do with white shame, white guilt, white everything, yes. yeah. So we just named a lot of white blank. White, white, white. Uh, <laughs> buy the book, buy five or 10. Give them to your mama, your daddy, your coworkers. We don't have time to go into all of them, but really understanding each of them individually and how it shows up within you, because it's been ingrained in you, is imperative to be able to do this work. Okay, so we're gonna move on. Okay. Okay. I'm toying between two questions. Okay. Are they two part questions? No, they're not. Okay. <laughs> So, in our social media society, we are ever seeing cultural appropriation of BIPOC. It's rampant. How is cultural appropriation not like a nod to like, that's so cool, but is actually upholding white supremacy and contributing to it? Yes, so one of the um, questions I often get is, but isn't this just cultural sharing? cultural exchange, that I'm appreciating that culture. Or another question I'll get is, but how do I know which is which? How do I know when I'm appropriating versus appreciating? Another question I get, and I remember this at a, um, I remember this at a women's leadership conference that I was speaking at where this question came up and a very upset white woman who was wearing Indian clothing stood up and she just had had it, I guess. <laughs> she had just had it and was basically like, 
when do we get to drop this? When can we just move on? Yes. When can we just move on and just, you know, essentially, when can I have the things that I want to have? Which, hello, colonization. <laughs> okay. So, how do, how, what is the best way to understand what cultural appropriation is? There is no list of you can do this and you cannot do this. There is no definitive list of this is cultural appropriation, this is not. You can have two people from the same culture and you ask them, is this thing cultural appropriation? And one will tell you, absolutely it is, without a doubt. And the other will say, I don't know, I feel like they're just appreciating the culture. Right? So get the idea out of your mind that there is a right way, a right answer, one answer. And that's the case for everything in this work. What's very important to understand, though, is the dynamics between the two cultures, your culture and the culture of the, over the question of is this appreciation or, or, or appropriation. If we have, in the context, if you imagine we have the two cultures here and around them is this environment, and if that environment comes with a history and a, a present of uh, things that ha have happened, such as colonization, genocide, land theft, um, what else? Enslavement, mm -hmm. right? If we have a context between those two cultures where one culture has dominated over the other culture, which, just sort of sidebar, the definition of white supremacy is, it comes from the idea that white people are superior to people of all other races and therefore deserve to dominate over those races. That is the seed of, white, of this thing called white supremacy. It is that white people are superior, end of. And everything else flows out from that. So we come back to our little circle here, and we have this environment that is poisonous, and we have one culture that has been domin dominant, and one culture which has been made inferior. How can you have exchange? Exchange would mean we're both equal. That's what exchange is. We can share. It's like saying between a bully and a victim that they can have an equal footing of relationship when one has had power over the other and has harmed the other and says, hey, you know what? That was in the past. Let's forget about that now. Now, can I have that? I'm just going to take it. That is how we need to understand cultural appropriation. So it's about beginning to critically examine when you're looking at something that you're using in your life that comes from a different culture of yours, have you taken a moment or even done deep work, deep research into understanding the cultural context, the historical context that exists between your culture and that culture and what it means today? Does that make sense? Yes. And so this whole work, anti-racism work, is beginning to learn this, this process of critical thinking and not just looking for the easy answers. Good person, not racist. Bad person, racist. No. Critical thinking. I heard an, uh, an author the other day, and I'm forgetting her name, unfortunately. Um, she talked about goodish, that we're all goodish, and that you're going to make mistakes. You're going to repeat those mistakes. Yeah. And, and that's where the critical thinking comes in is like, oh, there, I'm in the practice of this way, and now I've done this, right? So we're goodish and getting out of good and bad. That, I love that. Yeah. I love I mean, that. I'm goodish too. I mean, I, <laughs> we all make mistakes. Yeah. And sorry, I know you're going to go on to your question, but this is really yes, important what you just it. said. You have to have infinite compassion with yourself in this work. And not just, I don't mean this work, the 28 day process, I mean the lifelong work of anti racism. You will continue to make mistakes every single day. And you have to have infinite compassion because if you get into that spiral of shame and pain, you get stuck there and then it becomes about you you have to dust yourself off and say, of course I made a mistake because I grew up my entire life believing that I was superior. And that has been so ingrained into the structures of my brain that undoing that is like, it, it's just like, it's basically you're rewiring your brain. Right. So that's a loss of privilege, right? When you're actually starting to do the unwiring and you're having this loss of privilege, uh, What's the care for that, right? Because 
what would you advise? And you go over this a lot in the book about self-care, sustainability, moving through it, why you don't have, tw uh, there's no day off from the 28-day challenge. What, what's, why is self-care so important, what you're talking about, past compassion, to move through this book? So when we talk about loss of privilege first, I want to make this really clear. You still don't lose your white privilege. You still get to walk around with your white privilege, right? But what you're losing is the privilege to pretend that you don't know what's really going on. That's the loss that's happening, right? So I talk about self-care and sustainability at the beginning of the book because what I want is for you to actually practice this for the rest of your life. And what that means is you can't treat it like you're in a sprint. You have to treat it like you're in a marathon. And if you look at the difference between how a marathoner prepares for a, a marathon, they're preparing like months in advance, right? They got the whole gear, they got the food, they got everything, they got a plan. You know, they, they really have to take care. And that's how I want you to think of this as, if I'm going to be sustainable in this work, I really need to make sure I'm taking care of myself. I don't mean, spa dates, although those are great as well, you know. But in the processing, you might need therapy. For example, you know, in the processing, you might need to make sure that you have a group of people around you who are also doing the work that you can, pr you can process this emotionally with. Those are the kind of things that I'm, that I'm talking about. My deep, 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 deep desire is that we will live in a world where everybody is treated with their full humanity. So you can't this is my belief. In trying to do this work, you can't dehumanize yourself in the hopes that that will give black people, indigenous people, and people of color back our humanity. You dehumanizing yourself doesn't give us back our humanity. Does that make sense? But what will give us back our humanity is for you to stay in the work for the rest of your life and do it from a space of humanity and let us have our humanity. Yes. <laughs> I could like just sit and listen to you all day. <laughs> um, so if we're talking about it as if it's a marathon, so you know when someone's running a marathon and they're mile 12 and their legs are depleted, the lactic acid is building up, they have these gels? Yeah. Okay. So the circle way is kind of like those gels. And the circle way is that group of people that you can bring together to do this emotional work with. Um, and you talk a lot about it in the book. So very briefly, because it's important because it is separate of the Instagram challenge and this is what is new to the book. What should one do and not do in the circle way? Um, can you share a bit about that? Yes, so let me very quickly define what the Circle yeah. Way is for those of you who are not aware. Circle Way was a, is a book written by Anne Linnea and Christina Baldwin. Has anyone ever heard of it? Okay, so it's a, it's a brilliant book and a brilliant process. And its sort of tagline is that it empowers a leader in every chair. And if you can, if you're meeting in per person, you sort of, create the chairs in a circle, but if you're meeting virtually online, you have the metaphor of a circle. In a circle, there isn't one person that everyone's looking at. There is no single leader. Everybody is responsible for holding the circle in, in, in place. And so when people asked me, how can I do this work in groups? I knew that I needed to find a process in which we would not start recreating white supremacy through a group. What I mean by that is the well-meaning white person who says, you know what, I feel like I'm further ahead than those people, so I'm just gonna, I'm one of the good ones now. I know the language and I know the words and I have done the work, so <laughs> they, you know, they just don't know and I'm gonna lead them through this process. That gives you a cop out to do your work and it puts you in this, that same sort of dominant relationship with I'm this and they're that. And so what the circle way does, it just eliminates that by design. We don't have that. Everybody in the circle has to speak. Everybody in the circle has to be responsible for the meetings. There are different roles that there may be there just to help facilitate, but we rotate them each meeting. Um, and that's how we make sure that we don't c continue to perpetuate white supremacy in a circle. Thank you. Yeah.
And it's not for you to invite a BIPOC person to come in and do oh, yes. the group. Yeah. I mean, I, write, I feel like that should be fairly self-evident, but yeah. sometimes you have to spell Just it out. out. Yeah. Yeah. And we're yeah. going to move to a few audience questions. Okay. And we're running short on time. Sorry. <laughs> Don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. Okay. So fill in the blank. I would like more blank and less blank in my life. Who asked this question? Okay. Hi. Hi. Hey. You, that's a really thoughtful question. I would like less I would racism, like more, please. Uh, yes. <laughs> I would like less racism and more. I would like, for me personally, mm -hmm. I would like to have even more black girl magic in my life. I have a lot of, there are a lot of black women in this room and every space I go, and I can see you all smiling at me and I'm just so happy you're here. But I, every space that I have gone into, that has been like, I don't know why, but I just got so emotional. You're gonna go, <laughs> every single space I have been into, I have been prayed over by black women who don't even know me, who are literally like, I just heard about your work two weeks ago. And I just want to talk to you right now and let you know how much, how loved you are and how important you are and how much you mean to us, mm -hmm. that you're protected, that the ancestors are watching out mm -hmm. for you. That is like the best drug ever. Like it's the best <laughs> thing ever. So I would like more, 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 more of that and less racism, please. Amen. Great question. Thank you. When experiencing privilege in an individual interaction, how should you respond? Should you speak up and make it an educational moment? Okay, so in the book I talk about being called out and being called in and what should you do? Should you call out someone or should you call in someone? And remember when I said around cultural appropriation, there's no list. This is when you should and this is when you shouldn't. There is no list, you have to play it by ear. There is great merit, I believe, in white people having meaningful conversations with other white people and not just pointing the finger and saying, you did a bad thing. Because two things. First of all, you get to be on your mighty high horse again and say, I, you, I knew better than that. How come they didn't know? And the second thing is, they don't get to learn. And, the, and who they will have to learn from is by asking, black, indigenous, people of color, what did I do and help me process this? If you've been doing the work, you can help them process it because you now know where they're coming from. You had those, those same thoughts. You made those same mistakes. You believe those same things. You are the best person to talk to them. Great. Yeah. Thank you. How would you recommend approaching family about this work? They are liberal and open-minded but would rather not <laughs> Was that yours or theirs? That is theirs. Okay. okay. And mine. But would rather not be uncomfortable. I really want to share this with them. Who wants to be uncomfortable? Right. Literally nobody on earth, right? Nobody wants to be un uncomfortable. We talk about you and your family in the book. So I lead you through this 28-day process, right? So we do week one, the basics. Week two, anti-blackness, racist stereotypes, cultural appropriation. Week three, allyship. Week four, power, relationships, commitments. Because up until, you know, through week one, week two, week three, I've just asked you to look at yourself. I've kind of gotten you to sort of um, cocoon yourself and get internal, like, inside of yourself. But you live in the world with other human beings and have relationships with other human beings. And that needs to be a part of your anti-racism work, too. So we look at you and your friends, you and your family members, you know, the people in your life. Who knows your family better than you? Nobody. Who has had the upbringing and the context and the understanding of what was understood about race in your family as a sort of uh, a conversation? You. Is it the job of black indigenous people of color to convince your family member to do the work? No. It's not their job, it's your job. When we talk about losing privilege, losing privilege means 
part of it means no longer willing to say, it's just too hard to do that. They just don't want to listen to me. I tried and they're not listening. It's your job. And with this, in the same way that you, w you know how much it, you know after doing, if you've done the 28 day process or whatever anti-racism work that you've done, you know how much work it takes for you to get to the understanding that you're at. We go back to that idea of compassion. You can have compassion for them because they grew up differently to you, perhaps if they're your parents or elders, they grew up in a different time, they were taught different things. You know, have that conversation with them, but don't have it until you've done the work. Because when you've done the work, then you can speak to them like this instead of like this, right? But it is your responsibility and that is how you use your privilege. We often see this, how do I use my privilege? And what that often means is, how can I be a white savior? How can I go and help those black and brown people? Go talk to your family. That's how you use your privilege. Three more questions. Okay. Are these yours now or? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So 28 days, 28 days, no days off. Sorry. Why? Because you and I don't get days off from racism. Period. Period. So we do day one, two, three, four, five, six. We don't rest on the seventh day. We do a review. We do a review because you processed a lot in the last six days. So we do a re review. But it's about getting into the understanding that this isn't a project because black indigenous people of color are not living racism as if it's something that they can take days off from. It impacts them every moment of every day. So it should also impact me every moment of every day. Yeah, thank you. So Layla, I, uh, from the Good Answers Sester podcast to every interview to, Layla and I actually sat together 90 days ago today doing a similar talk at NYU. Yeah. You've now done three weeks of talks. You did three weeks one of week. talks. No, one I've week. done one week. Yeah. One week, two, yeah. two weeks to two go. Two weeks to go. Three weeks back then. You're on numerous uh, podcasts. You've written this book. You're on the next stage of what this book is going to be already. I don't know. You can share it. Oh, it's going to be for children. Aww. How do we explain this to children? Yay. Yeah. Yes. Yay. So you have just opened up your life. And if you follow Layla on Instagram, she's, she talks about her life. She shares about her children. She shares about her family. She shares what they do to take care of each other. She shares stories. I mean, it's just incredible. You didn't have to do this. You didn't have to open up your life. You didn't have to open up your life knowing the onslaught of criticism, harassment, threats, in addition to living a black experience. You didn't have to do any of that. Right. Why? Because when you're called to something, there's no rational, logical explanation. And I have tried to talk myself out of it multiple times. And every time I did, I was brought right back. When you're supposed to be doing something, you can try as hard as you can to say, I'm done. I did the Instagram challenge and said, I'm done. Okay, okay, all right, God, okay, I'll do the workbook. And then I'm really done. I'm really, really done. And now we're here with the book. And when I was in the process of writing the book, and actually before writing it, when I was in the process of kind of like contracting with publishers and all of that, I really had to like have a moment with myself. Mm -hmm. Layla, are you really sure you're gonna do this? Because yes, it's had this great impact in the world, but when you put yourself into the world in an even bigger way, you become an even bigger target, especially as a black Muslim woman who has a voice and who isn't jumping around the subject, but calling her work me and white supremacy, mm -hmm. right? So. The choice to do that, I had to really sit with that. And the understanding and the aligning that I came to within myself is I don't do my work for white people. My work is for white people to do, but it is not for their benefit. The beneficiaries of my work, I have a hierarchy of who this work is for. Number one is for me, 
I deserve to live in a world where I'm treated like a whole human being. Yes. I'm the first beneficiary of my work. <sighs> the second is my children and my husband. Mm -hmm. You know, my family, my nephew and my niece. They deserve that too. And all little boys and girls and, ki and kids and people of all genders, they deserve that too. I do it for black women and for my sisters who are in the room and for black indigenous people of color. And yes, white people are in there as well because I do my work for humanity and everybody of every race deserves to live in a world where we're all treated with our humanity and, and live in a world where we're all treated equally. So coming to that aligning within myself took me out of being a servant and took me into being of service. Mm. And being of service means, and I, I need to like, I do this in every interview, I need to shout out my mentor, Dr. Frantonia Pollins. I know I said her name earlier, but she is so integral to me being able to sit here and say this and mean it and embody it. She taught me how as a black woman to do this work from a place of I am my first priority. That I can write a book that is entirely for white people and even still, I am my first priority. And that's how I have the fuel or the energy or the whatever to keep going, even though the work is very, very hard. So you answered my question for the, uh, which was going to be for the beautiful BIPOC people in the space that are doing anti-racism work, that are doing powerful work, that are leaders, that are standing out, that are depicted as, oh, here's that lady that talks about race again, right? You just answered the question, so thank you for that. Thank you. So before I get into my last question, um, again, follow us, Layla F. Saad, Ignite with Melissa, Hashtag me and white supremacy. Buy a million books, then buy another Please 10. help me make it the biggest book ever. Yes. Please yes, do. Yes, yes. After we're done, I'm going to get up and we're going to form a line over here. Okay. We're going to come over. If you'd like to take a picture with Layla, we're going to shepherd a line over here. See, she just keeps giving. She's like, <laughs> keeps, it's like the gift that keeps giving. She's going to come over here, so we're going to have you form a line over here, and you're going to come, and you're going to take a picture with Layla. Because of time, we don't have enough time to give everybody a hug. So there's going to be no hugging tonight. We're prioritizing hugs for loved ones of Layla, who, know yeah. they, who they know who they are. Yes. yes. <laughs> and um, we're asking for no additional autographs. You have a pre-signed book if you bought one from the store. No videos. And... Um, to take your picture and to share a few words and then to keep moving so everyone can get a chance to be with Layla, yeah. okay? Can Thank we all you. agree on that? Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So our last question. So this work, you, this burning desire in you center around, centers around the question, yeah. how do I become a good ancestor? Let's fast forward a very long time from now. And you, well, you already are a good ancestress, so I, I, I want to say that while I'm speaking from a eulogy perspective, you already are. Thank you. And I love you, friend. I love you, too. Okay. So we're fast forwarding from a really long time, and from a eulogy perspective, and you are a good ancestress, and there's many more books, and this and that, and a movie and a show, and... A, Everything. a coloring book and a lunchbox <laughs> and I, I don't know what else. <laughs> Dolls and t-shirts and clothing. And I, don't, I don't know. Speak it. Yes. Answer this final question for me. Layla Saad, the incomparable ancestress, was. Was. A woman a black Muslim woman who was proud of every part of herself, who owned her entire humanity. And though she lived in a time and in an environment that said that people who looked like her and who had the identities that she had meant that she was lesser than, she knew that wasn't the truth. And she lived, herself, she lived her life. And the real truth was that 
which was that she was everything, that black women are everything. And that's how she walked on this earth. Yeah. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, Leila Saad. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. So just a couple of directions. For the photo op, we're going to ask that if you're waiting for it, you stay seated. We're going to call you up in rows, starting with the first row and then moving back. If you have yet to purchase a book, we have some for sale at the registers now. If you're planning on exiting, I'm going to ask that you use the elevator or the back elevator and not the stairwell. Again, please do not exit through the stairwell. Thank you. So if I can have the first row stand up and prepare to line up, just going straight back this way. <laughs> <laughs>